much about what I would uh, talk about tonight. And um, some of the things I will make mention of, I will not uh, infringe about what Brother Bond is bringing uh, about the Holy Spirit. He did a real good job Wednesday night about the Holy Spirit, but I needed to lead off uh, in my thoughts tonight. If you'd like a copy of my outline or my paper, uh, raise your hand and Brother Graham will bring you one if you want one. So Brother Graham, look around. And, but uh, I title this, Lessons to Learn. Lessons to Learn. To the believer, the Bible is our source book. I think we're all pretty well familiar with that because in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, it tells us that this book is, <clears throat> is breathed by God and is profitable for our doctrine or teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So the Bible is our source book. The Spirit is our guide that no one needs to teach us. In, John, in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 27, it says, But the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you, and you need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you all things, and is truth, and is not, and no lie, even as he has taught you, he shall abide in him. A lot of times we, we get a little hung up on that because I had arguments with individuals in churches that I had pastored that uh, the church really doesn't need teachers. <clears throat> uh, really doesn't need teachers. Well, if that be so, then we have a problem. If the Holy Spirit is our sole teacher and we don't need anybody else to teach, you can understand why we have such a mixed up world. Because there are a lot of people that are not listening to the Spirit of God. Matter of fact, there's a lot of people that don't understand how the Spirit of God works in their life. So when you study the Scripture, you'll find out that God has called men to teach. Turn your Bible with me to Romans, if you would, please. Romans chapter 12. In 1 Corinthians, he talks about the gifts that were given, and one individual in the church was talking about this, and one was talking about that, and one was talking... It was not a plurality of people, just uh, everybody out of, out of control. It was one person that was given the ability to do this, and another one that. In the book of Romans, he points out here, uh, in verse 5, it says, For I say through the grace of through the grace given unto me to everyone that is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think but to think soberly according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith there, there, there's a, when you start, start talking about church membership we, we all do not have the same measure of faith but we have the availability of faith. Faith is tone piston, the, the doctrine or the systematic teachings of Christ. We all have access to that, but because of our disposition and so forth, we do not advance in our faith system as the Lord would want us to do. That's why a lot of times we have problems in churches. He goes on and he says, For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every, every one member one of another. Having then gifts different according to the grace that is given unto us, rather prophecy, that's proclaiming, let us proclaim. That word prophecy means proclaim. It doesn't mean talk extra Bible revelation. According to the proportion of faith. Or ministry, let him wait on his ministry. Or he that teaches on teaching. And so the Lord has incorporated in his church 
individuals calling them for specific areas that need to be fulfilled. But all of these areas are dealing with the Spirit of God calling, the Spirit of God giving that individual the ability to work in that area that they're going to be doing. I don't care if it's exhortation. I don't care if it's teaching. I don't care what area it might be then it's all through what the Spirit of God is doing through the individual for the benefit of the church because all of us make up the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. So here we find that he has given us teachers. Go with me to the book of Ephesians chapter 4. In Ephesians chapter 4, and you'll find here that he says about verse, uh, let's see, chapter 4, Let's look about verse 11. Uh, 11. Let me get it where I need to be. In Ephesians 4, he says, uh, in, okay, let me get here. <clears throat> in the verses above that, he talks about Christ ascending, and when he ascended, he gave gifts unto individuals, that's for the benefit of the church. And then it says in verse 11, and he gave some apostles and some prophets. We don't have those today. Okay. And some evangelists, we have those. And some preachers and teachers. Okay. The preacher is the overseer. The teachers are those who are expounding the word of God. For what purpose? For the perfecting of the saints. Those are those who have separated themselves from the world. That's what happens when we're baptized. We have actually followed the Lord in baptism, separate ourselves from the world, and become members of his body and followers, if I can use the term disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Until we what? He goes on and he says, till we all come to the unity of, of the faith, that tone pistol, the, the, the unity of the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. That doesn't mean to stay in the basics. It means to grow beyond the basics and become matured. And that's what he's talking about here in this verse. So he says what? That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. Okay? And the sliding cunningness of man Okay? But by speaking the truth in love may grow up unto him in all things. That's the purpose of the teacher. To stand before a class or stand before the people and present God's word that we might grow in grace and knowledge and what is going to happen there is the power of the Holy Spirit intervening and giving you ears to hear, a heart to understand and eyes to see. Okay? Now, the thing of it is, when you put these pieces of the puzzle together, church members, I don't care if it's your devotion at home, I don't care if it's your thought wherever you are, I don't care if it's in church, you are listening to what the Spirit of God is saying. Okay? Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3 talks about uh, listening to the Spirit, go over here in chapter chapter 2, and it's interesting because, and this is another message by itself, that the church at Ephesus, remember, they were so involved with stuff that they began to walk away from the love of Christ, their first love. There's a lot of people that way, they get so involved in stuff that they're no longer really loving the Lord. They're just doing stuff. And that's what these people were doing. And he said he had one thing against them because they had what? They had fallen out of love on how they started out. A lot of times I weigh that in my own life. Do I really love the Lord like I did when I was first saved? What was that, what was that zeal there? to talk to people and, and to do things for the Lord. And then after a while you find yourself getting so preoccupied like seminary with me and so forth like that 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 part started phasing out. 
And that's the part that we're supposed to safeguard according to Jew. We're supposed to keep ourselves in the love of God. But down through here, you'll notice in, in the church at, at Ephesus, and at the church, uh, as you go down through here, he talks about Smyrna, and he talks about uh, uh, Pergamos. Now, if you'll notice every one of these, he concludes, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. And then immediately, right after that, he gives a blessing to the overcomer. Now, there's a reason I'm bringing this out. That's why I'm saying it's another lesson all by itself. When you get to Thyatira, which is your Pentecostal, because Pergamos is your Catholic, when you get to the per when you get to the Pente uh, the uh, the Protestant movement and all what was going what's going on and their develop and all of that, then you find out he changes tune. What he concludes now, he says this like 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 Thyatira, there in verse eighteen, he goes down here and he says in verse twenty six, he gives the overcomer. And after the overcomer, then he says, he that hath an ear, let him hear. There's a reason because those churches that follow, he says, does this very same thing. After, there's a point of maturity. And that's what we find when we study these seven churches of Asia. Is there's a point that the Lord works with us. And he says, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Otherwise, when you come to the church, do you focus on what the pastor and what the teacher is saying, or are you focusing on what the Lord is showing you and teaching you what is being taught and what is being preached? If you focus on the preacher and you focus on the teacher, you have a problem. Because there are a lot of churches out there, the teachers are wrong and the preachers are wrong, and if you grab a hold of their coattail and hang on to it, they can take it off and lay it right there on the bench. Where would that leave you? But if you're, li if you're listening to the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God is giving you something just for you. Just for you. It might not be anybody else in the church. It's just for you you. And so when you go along here and, and you see that he, he says this first and then he gives the blessing, the overcomer, this is what's going to happen. And then he changes it with, Thesita, with, with, uh, with uh, the church at uh, Thesatira and he gives the blessing first and then he says, listen, why? Because there should be a point in every one of God's people serving him, separating themselves for his cause, that you mature enough that when you mature, you're already listening. And so what he's going to do is see, I'm going to give you a blessing now. Are you listening? And that's why that shows up in the change. And that's always amazing to me when I study these things in the Word of God. Over the years, I have, ha I have had so many say that they just don't understand the Bible. It's either preachers mudding the spiritual water or God's people resisting the Spirit's voice within themselves. And I think it falls in both of those categories. There are some preachers that stay in the basics and never get into the deeper water of the Word of God. And then there are preachers that get into the deeper water water of God and the people don't want it. I was told that in some churches that I pastored, your teaching needs to be in the seminary. It does not need to be in the church. This is exactly where the teaching needs to be in the church so God's people can grow up and they can mature and they can get better. So if you will allow me for a little bit, I'd like to deal with my own folly if you'll put up with me. What I mean by that is, is where the Lord brought me. And I'm going to explain this. In my case, I was not, I, I'm not an exception to the rule. Only that I have been called to preach. When, I, when I'm getting ready to show you what happened to me, happened to you. 
The only, only difference was is how I responded to it and how my life was back there. Okay? Back there. I was being groomed to be a good child of the devil. And there was a lot of things back there. I'm a very private person and I will not ever talk to you about it. Okay? My wife had problems with me and the Lord worked that all out and she found out how it all came about. And that gave her understanding to me. When the Lord found me, I was in a very, very, very bad place. Matter of fact, the very day that I received Christ as my personal Savior, the Lord laid on my heart to start reading the book of Romans. I got down in chapter 1, verse 21, that they knew God, but they glorified him not a God. I knew God. I did not know him. I knew about him. I didn't know him. But I know him now. And what he was doing is taking me down through there and show me everything that I was influenced by. And in verse 28, after turning them over three, two times, he, the third turning over, he said, I'll turn you over to a reprobate mind. You were never there. Maybe some have. Marvin and I have talked about he was pretty well there in some areas. But it was a very hard place. And when I looked at that verse and I read that, it was as if God said, now you look at that, look at it real close. If you wouldn't have trusted me that day, that's where you would have ended up. I cried like a baby. So my, my personal experience does not match yours, okay? You might have been raised up in your church all of your life. So my testimony would be totally different than your testimony, but both of us came to realize that we stood in need because we were sinners and we needed Christ. And we responded by repentance to God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and something happened inside. In my case, Peter's writings came to surface in chapter 2 and chapter 3. Turn your Bible with me. 1 Peter. In 1 Peter chapter 2. In 1 Peter chapter 2, looking at verse 2 and 3. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that they may grow thereby. I did. I did. And then it goes on and he said, if so you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. I did. I did. And in my maturing, I read over in Hebrews, turn there with me, Hebrews chapter 6. In Hebrews chapter 6, he says, leaving the principles of Christ. That doesn't mean to, to walk away from the principles of Christ. What he's talking about in verse 1 and 2 is the basics. The basics of the doctrine, the principles of Christ. The basics of perfection. The basics of laying the foundation of repentance. The basics of works. And the basics of faith towards God. These were all basics, the basics of the doctrine of baptism, the basics of the laying out of hands, the basics of the resurrection, and the basics of the judgment. If, if, a pastor, if a, As a pastor, if I deal with the basics all the time, that's all I'm talking about. But he says to go on in maturity if God will allow it. You see, God will allow his children to get stuck and stay in the basics. But he wants us to go on into maturity. Are you following me? He wants us to go on into maturity. But here's what it does in verse 3. This is the will of God, if God permit, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened. Now watch this. I don't know about you, but this is where the Spirit of God was teaching me. He was, he was kind of like that unction that John was talking about. Laying this on my heart, like I whispering in my soul. He says, "What well, once enlightened? That means illuminated. That that means you you see something you never saw began saw before because it's spiritual discernment. It's something the world cannot see. It's something the natural man can't see. It's something that the only the spirit of the individual that has been born again can see." Hold your hand here. Go with me to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. 
1 Corinthians chapter 2. It's not in your notes. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Let's start by verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. But it is written, I has not seen, neither has heard, neither have it entered into the hearts of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. But God has revealed unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of man save the spirit of man which is in man or in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we may know know the things that are freely given to us of God by which also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know, because they are spiritually discerned. If you, if you understand a biblical truth, it's not because of you, it's because the Spirit of God has revealed it to you and He has spoke into your spirit that truth and you see it. And that's the joy. That's our response. We see something we never, never saw before because God has allowed us to see it. And that, in my case, it brings excitement. So go back to Hebrews. So there is that enlightenment. And then there is the tasting of the heavenly gift that we, we know where we're going and we are partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. These verses right here, listening to the Spirit of God and how he presents those to my heart gave me the security of my heart and my soul and my salvation. When I locked into that, I never had a problem again with, can I lose my salvation? No. No, it's locked in because we're sealed by the Spirit of God. These things bring what we call maturity. But we have to ask. I had problems. I was not a very good educated man. I had problems. My pastor, when I surrendered to follow the Lord, and we never know what the Lord wants to do with us. All we do is just lay ourselves out. Uh, I didn't know if he was calling me to preach. I didn't know if he was calling me to pastor or what. All I know is he was calling me and I responded to it. And I responded to the call to preach and teach the word of God. Okay. When I did that, my pastor uh, took me to Little Rock, introduced me to the school down there. And when I went to school down there, they gave me tools to study the Word of God. But the Spirit of God was the one who was speaking to my spirit, teaching me. Yes, there were men there that were good teachers. Some of them were. Some of them were fantastic. And they would present a case. And the Holy Spirit would give that sense of illumination. And I would see it. And I'd get excited. And I'd study it out and study it out and become secured in what I was studying, okay, studying. So, so all, all, all of this was showing up, but I had to ask over there in James chapter 1, verse 5 and 6. Go over there, James chapter, uh, chapter 1 with me. Notice what he says. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask God that giveth to, to all liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind that is tossed. Well, you have to ask. Now the problem of it is, I ask. But how was I asking? Turn your Bible with me to Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11 and verse 13. 
If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give you the Holy Ghost to them that ask him? So I had to realize, if I'm asking for faith, I have to realize that faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And the Spirit of God is the one that takes that Word of God and illuminates it within my spirit that I can discern spiritually what he's saying. Now listen, we all have that. Yes. We all have that ability. The problem of it is, a lot of people will not respond to it. And when you do not respond to it, the Holy Spirit is the shyest person of the Trinity, and he will not force himself. But if you open that door, he does something. Turn with me to John. Turn with me to John for a moment. John in chapter 14 talks about the Spirit of God coming. He's going to pray to the Father, verse 16 and 17. And, and uh, that this comforter. I want you to notice something with me in verse 21. Uh, this this um, um, it was, was so rich uh, uh, to me. Uh, let's see here. Uh, chapter 4, oh, I'm in the wrong chapter. <laughs> 21. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loves me. There's our proof text. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest, okay, manifest myself to him. How does he do that? Paul said that in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 6, that the Spirit of God, which is the Spirit of Christ, causes us to identify with God as our Papa. Our Papa. Abba, Father. Our, our, our divine Papa. The Spirit of Christ does that. So the Spirit of Christ manifests Himself. How does He do that? By discerning the Word to our spirit. I, am, I, am I going too far? Am I going too deep? I, I don't want to. We all have that ability to do that. And so when we follow the Holy Spirit, He becomes the teacher he becomes the one who guides us into all truth. And that should be uh, John chapter 16, 13, and 14. Not, you don't have 134th verse. <laughs> but then he hooks all of this stuff together that we can understand it. In Psalms chapter 27, nine, 7 and 9, he says, You have said, what? Seek my face. That's exactly what you find in John 14, 21. He will manifest his face. That is spiritual discernment. No, no, you're not going to see the face of God. You're going to see spiritual truth. You're going to come into spiritual light. And Jesus said, I'm going to manifest myself to you. We all have that ability. Okay? So, where does it all begin? Well, here's my, where my folly comes in. Every one of you know that Psalms 119 is my psalm. Why did I make it my psalm? Because of this man in this psalm could care less about his walk with God until he met some that cared about their walk with God. And he started seeing in these individuals what he ought to be. And he makes the change. When I studied this, I had problems. Because he uses the word statute 25 times. He uses the word precept 21 times. He uses the commandment 22 times. He uses the testimonies of God 23 times. 
He uses the word judgment 20 times. He uses the truth and the word, the truth and the word 41 times. He uses the way of God when he says, Lord, show me the way on how your precepts work. Show me how the way of your statutes work. That, that's used in there about 18 times. So you see a lot of repetition. But what he's doing is he's focused on what God's word is saying and adapting to what the word of God is saying and he was, making the adjust, the, he was making the adjustments in his application as he's going through life. All because of the Word of God. And he kept on saying over and over again, quicken me. Make me alive inside to you. Because he was faced with a whole lot of things. Things that I was faced with. Same things you're faced with. He was going through them. So that psalm became very rich to my education. But that wasn't the starting point. The starting point is found in Proverbs <laughs> chapter 30. Turn there with me. Chapter 30. And I'm just going to scoot through this. We don't have time. <coughs> I met a man here in this, in this proverb by the name, and I put it down on your paper in the Hebrew, how it's pronounced, Agar. And it seems like he's a mentor in verse 1. But he was not that way at one time. Some say this was Solomon. Some say this. I don't care less. What the Spirit of God was doing was showing something to me that I needed to understand. And that's what he does. We can get so uh, stuck on stuff that we lose out what God wants us to do. So where did he bring me? He brought me to verse 2. Surely I am more brutish than any man and have not the understanding of a man. I never learned wisdom nor have the knowledge of the holy. Who has ascended up into heaven or descended? Who has gathered the winds in his fist? Who has bound the waters in a garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is his son's name? If thou canst tell. Every word of God is pure. Be a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Right here, he began to work. I realized I didn't have the wisdom I needed. I didn't have the knowledge I needed. I had to bow and I had to ask. And then I started asking about the same question and I said, who are you who created all this? Who are you? And that took me on, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a survey of research and watching God bring everything together and how his son is holding it all together. And it became so enriched that people when they, kid, people in school were having a problem with me because I was asking questions and they couldn't answer them, even the teachers. But the Holy Spirit was answering those as I studied the Word of God. And I found out as I studied the Word of God, I could not add to it lest he reproved me. And there was a lot of that going on back at that time. But then he says some things in verse 7, 8, and 9. He says, Two things I have required of thee. Deny me them not before I die. Now notice these. Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me. Lest I be full and deny thee and say who is the Lord. Or lest I be poor and still and take the name of God in vain. I have watched that. I have watched that with people of God. I have watched that with the Jewish people, that when persecution and hardship comes, the first thing they did is defected from the one who could help them. We see it all the time. We see it in church work. This man was honest to the core. 
And he said, Lord, take care of me and provide my needs. I don't want to be poor because I know what that'll do. And the Lord takes care of us. I can't explain it. But ever since the Lord and I have been in the ministry, ever since we've been in the work of the Lord, He's always seen fit that we had what we need, even though the very day we didn't have it, that evening we had it. I, I don't understand it, but He does. And all things work together for good to those who love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. That is a promise. So don't give up on God. Give up on the world, not God. And then he says in verse 10, accuse not a servant unto his master. And I wrote, read Romans chapter 14, verse 4. It says, I am his servant. How dare you bring an accusation against me? Who are you to judge another man's servant? <laughs> I'm thankful I'm his servant. So when people start making their judgmental remarks towards me, do you know what I do? I smile. Because <laughs> I know who's in charge. <laughs> that hurts, yes. But I know who's in charge. And I can smile. Because they, they don't even know what they're talking about. The Lord is my judge. The Lord is my Father. The Lord is my God. The Lord is my Savior. But then I had to realize the generations. I had to realize people. When I left here the first time, the Lord took me back and I continued to study. I ended up in a college, seminary college, and I became on the faculty member and I taught after I graduated. I taught at the seminary. That was quite an experience because he took me in the areas where I began to learn about people. And so these verses right here, I could not deny this was a learning cycle. Look with me at verse, verse uh, 11. There is a generation or there are people that curse their father and doeth not bless their mother. Do you know any like that? Get around us. Let's go on. There is a generation or there is people that are pure in their own eyes and yet is not washed from their own filthiness. Have you met people that way? We all have. We have to come to realization. We can't live in a state of doubt. I have it in my family. Well, back up. All of my family's dead. My dad gave me all kinds of problems. He got, we got that worked out to a certain degree. All my brothers and sisters are gone. That's all gone. My one brother wouldn't even allow me to talk to him about the Lord in his house. <laughs> I hurt. But I couldn't control that, but it's all right here. There's a generation, there's people, how lofty are their eyes and their eyelids are lifted up. Have you met those prideful people? I have. You have. All of us have. The people that will live in denial when it starts coming into their family and their surroundings, they'll deny it and then they will blame church members and they'll blame this. No, no, no. It's happening all around us. Don't live in denial. Be honest about it. He goes on, he says, there's a generation whose teeth are swords and their jaw teeth as knives to devour the poor from off the earth and the needy from men. They're all around us. <coughs> we all experience it. And it hurts, doesn't it? That's reality. That's life. We have to deal with it. But the thing we have We've been saved. We have given, been given a promise that we're going to be taken home when we die. And if Jesus comes, we're going to take you out and meet him. We got a promise. No matter what happens around us, we got a promise. I will never, never leave you. 
I will never, never forsake you. We got a promise. He promises those things. Let's go on. And I'm going to finish this. I'm not going to be able to deal with it all. He goes on from this point on. And he talks about terrible things. He talks about good things. He talks about three of these on a fourth and three of these on a fourth. Every one of them gives us the whole process when you look at it at the world through the eyes of Scripture. Through the eyes on what God sees. And if we're not willing to see what He sees, how in the world are we going to cope with it when we ask Him? Amen? The last couple of verses is what drove me right to my doorstep. Verse 32. If thou hast done foolishly, foolishly in lifting up thyself, or if thou hast thought evil, lay thy hand upon your mouth. Surely the cunning of milk bringeth forth butter, and the wrangling of the nose bringeth forth blood. So the forcing of wrath bringeth forth strife. You want to develop wrath? You want to develop seditions? You want to develop hardships in the church? You want to have bad attitudes? Go ahead. You're going to pay the consequence. What do you think we're gathered for? What, what do you think we're a church family about? Is we got our arms around one another. We're supportive. Supposed to be supportive. Loving. Encouraging. Lifting up. Stabilizing one another. Isn't it amazing a lot of times we cut each other down? Say things we shouldn't be saying? Our Sunday school lesson will be dealing with that. When I got to these last two verses after I did an extensive study as a spirit talked to my spirit because of these things I realized how close I had to walk to the Lord so I wouldn't lift myself up so I wouldn't say things and I have to be very careful because I got enough of my dad in me that I can become spiteful and I have to fight against that but I have to be honest with it I know it's there. And I have to be very, very careful. Because I don't want anything to bankrupt my walk with the Lord. Amen? How about you? I hope I've given you something to think about. So the topic is lessons to learn. I've learned through every one of these because of that unction. The Spirit of God is speaking to my spirit about these things. And I pursued and I sought them out and I searched them out and I dug out and I realized every one of them, the good and the bad, and they're around every one of us every day of our life. Either we can walk with the Lord and be happy in that walk, it's a decision, it's a choice, or we can be a grumpy old man. And I told the wife the other day, am I getting to be a grumpy old man? <laughs> I don't want to be a grumpy old man. I want to reflect Jesus. How about you? On the cross, what did he say? Father, forgive them. What did Stephen say when they were stoning him? Forgive them. For they don't know what they're doing. We should know why they're doing it. Amen? And find comfort. But the Lord said, they did it to me, they'll do it to you. Now you just do what I did. You stick in and you keep your focus on the Lord. Amen. I hope you've listened. I hope I've given you something to think about tonight. May we bow in prayer. With our heads bowed, Marv, will you dismiss us?